Hello, I'm Anurag, and I'll be talking about some of my recent work on video understanding with imperfect data. We all know that neural networks work very well, but they also have millions of parameters and need to be trained with lots of data. This is particularly the case with deep CNN and transformer-based models. However, we cannot always label large amounts of data, and this is especially the case for tasks beyond image classification. In this talk, I'm going to be focusing on video understanding. For more detailed tasks, like spatial temporal action detection or video segmentation, it's simply too expensive to label every frame of the video. Datasets for these tasks are thus small or have weak labels. And furthermore, in video, detailed annotations are often difficult to obtain. For example, it's ambiguous to label when an action starts and ends. And finally, large-scale datasets like those used in image classification or NLP don't exist. And this makes training large video-specific models challenging. In this talk, I will present two recent works. In the first one, we trained large, pure transformer video models without the massive datasets that are typically required for training such models. In the second part of the talk, I'll show how we can train spatial temporal action detection models from already coarse video level tags by leveraging uncertainty estimates to account for noise. First, I'll talk about recent work on pure transformer models for video. CNNs have become the de facto model for vision tasks. Whilst in NLP, they have long been transformers. Quite recently, the vision transformers paper from colleagues and brain showed that pure transformer models for images were already if effective. There are many previous papers using self-attention or transformers in vision. So perhaps it's a bit surprising that the authors followed their attention is all you need with the minimal changes. However, what was essential was, was to use large-scale training data because training on standard ImageNet 1K was not enough. In this project, we extended the idea of it to videos. To handle the large number of tokens that one would encounter in video, we explored more efficient factorized attention variants. And since transformers are high capacity models and video data sets are comparatively small, we also show how to effectively regularize such models and also how to make use of pre-trained image models as well. The transformer is a generic model that operates on a sequence of tokens. So the first question is how we generate these tokens from video. The first simple approach is to uniformly sample frames from the video and then to extract 2D patches from these frames as done in VIT. Another approach that works a bit better is to view the video as a 3D volume and to extract non-overlapping 3D tubelets from the input volume and then to encode each tubelet into a token. In this case, temporal information is being encoded right from the tokenization process. With this, our most simple model is to simply forward our spatial temporal tokens through a sequence of transformer layers, following that attention is all you need and fit. However, this requires a lot of computation since attention has quadratic complexity and the high capacity of the network means it can easily overfit on smaller data sets. As a result, we developed three more variants of a model which are all more efficient. They factorize attention along space and time at different points of the transformer architecture. And this also corresponds to different space-time and attention patterns. The first variant is where we factorize the transformer encoder. So in other words, we first have a spatial encoder, which encodes tokens from each frame independently. And then we fuse all these tokens together with the second temporal transformer. An alternative is to factorize the self-attention operation along the space and time axes within each transform block. And the final variant is to modify multi-head attention to compute attention only along the spatial axes for half the heads and only the temporal axis for the other half of the heads. In all cases, self-attention is performed between a smaller set of tokens, and so these models are all more e efficient. We first look at encoding the input into tokens. The top row is uniform frame sampling. And we can see from the rows below that tubelet embedding works better 
if we initialize the 3D filters ap appropriately. There are multiple ways of doing this. First, we can randomly set the weights of the initial embedding projection, but it's better to reuse the embedding from the image pre-trained model. But that operates on 2D patches, and this is 3D because it has a time axis too. So a common, common way of converting 2D filters to 3D is filtering inflation from the i3D paper. That replicates a 2D filter along the time axis. But what works even better is to initialize the 3D filter to, se to select the center frame of the input tube. So it's actually identical to uniform frame sampling at initialization. But then it learns to aggregate tem temporal information during the tokenization process as the network is trained. We also look at different variants of a model using the same number of tokens across each one. For large datasets like Kinetics, our naive unfactorized model works best, but it also uses the most compute and is the slowest as it calculates the tension between all pairs of, sp of spatial temporal tokens. Our factorized encoder model is the fastest and has a good balance between accuracy and speed. We also have a baseline, which is shown by the last set of bars, based on the factorized encoder. Here, we extract token features independently from the different frames and average pool their representations, rather than using a temporal transformer to combine this information. That does quite a bit worse, with almost the same runtime. However, on smaller datasets like Epic Kitchens, the unfactorized model can overfit more easily. And here, the factorized encoder does better in the same setting. One important thing to note about video datasets is that they are quite a bit smaller than their image counterparts. So we have to regularize the model to train it well. In all cases, we initialize the weights of our transformer from image models pre-trained on ImageNet21K or JFT. And it's ImageNet21K unless otherwise stated. And then for training on, comparat on comparatively smaller data sets, like Epic Kitchens or something something, we have to use even more regularizers, as you can see in the table here. All of these methods have been proposed independently for training ResNets, but they work quite well here too. And note that these extra regularizers have also been used by the DIT paper to be able to train fit on normal ImageNet 1K. We evaluated on five different video classification benchmarks across a wide range of domains. For example, kinetics and moments in time consist of YouTube videos, Epic Kitchens is egocentric, and something something looks at fine grained motions. And we got state of the art results across all five of them. In general, we train from a bit model pre trained on ImageNet 21K, and we obtain further improvements when we use JFT pre training instead. So to conclude this part of the talk, we developed a family of pure transformer architectures for video and showed how we can train them. Our goal is to predict a bounding box in both space and time of when an action is being performed. Most approaches to solving this problem are based on detectors like SSD or faster RCNN, which have been extended temporally. And so they predict bounding boxes for a frame or a set of frames given some temporal context. One major drawback is that most approaches to this problem are fully supervised. So they require bounding box annotations for every frame in the video. And this is not feasible for large real-world datasets. Moreover, annotating temporal boundaries of actions is ambiguous. Annotators often don't agree with each other on when an action starts and ends. So in this paper, we only use weak annotations in the form of video level labels, as you can see here. These are much cheaper because we're just given the actions that occur in, in a video with no information about how long these occur for or which people perform them. The overview of the method is to use off-the-shelf person detectors and multiple instance learning. As I will describe, person tubelets form the bags for our multiple instance learning. However, 
as the MIL assumption is often violated in our case, we also predict the uncertainty of each instance in the bag to address this issue. Multiple instance learning is a common technique used in weekly supervised scenarios. Here we have a bag of training examples where each bag can be of a variable size. And we already know the label of the bag. So the standard MIL assumption is that one or more instances in the bag have the given label, but we don't know which instances they are. The typical way to address this is to have an instance level classifier that predicts the probabilities for each instance in the bag. And then these instance level predictions are aggregated into a bag level prediction for which we do have supervision. And then we can train our neural network as normal using a cross entropy loss on the bag level predictions and labels. Common aggregation functions include the max, smooth approximations of the max, such as a log sum exponential, averaging or retention, which is, which is effectively a learned weighted average. So in our scenario, we extract person tubelets using an off the shelf person detector that has not been trained on the target data set. And by tubelet, we mean person detections that have been linked over at most K frames. And then all person tubelets from the video form a bag. And we have a single bag level label for all the tubelets. The standard MIL assumption is therefore that at least one tubelet in the bag has the given label. However, in our case, there is a lot of noise in our bags and the MIL assumption that at least one instance in our bag has the given label is often wrong. Firstly, there's actually a lot of tubelets in a video and there's no way that we can fit them all in memory. As a result, we uniformly sample tubelets from each bag and so we might choose tubelets which do not actually have the given label. And there can be errors in our person detector and tracker. False negatives are a particular issue because it means that we might not actually have a person detection for the labeled action in our bag at all. We can also have false positive detections when the data set does not label all humans exhaustively, as you can see on the video here. To address these issues, we also predict the uncertainty for each instance in the bag. The intuition is in that to minimize the training error, the network should predict the right label with a low uncertainty when it is possible. And when it's not possible due to the noise in the bags, the network shouldn't be able to predict the right label, but it can predict a high uncertainty to compensate for this. And the network gets penalized the most when it predicts a wrong label with a high confidence or low uncertainty. The loss surface on the right shows these cases where brighter colors correspond to a higher loss. Our overall network architecture is a fast RCNN style detector using person tubelets as proposals. In our experiments, we use SlowFast based on ResNet50 as the backbone. For our experiments, we use two datasets. UCF10124 is the most common for this problem of spatial temporal action detection. It consists of sport videos from YouTube, which are labeled at each frame. There's quite a bit of label noise as there are lots of people in the background not doing a labeled action, as shown before. And on this dataset, the protocol is to link the detections over time and then to calculate the video AP, which uses the spatial temporal IOU between the predictions and ground truth. We also present the first weekly supervised results in AVA. This is a much larger data set of clips from movies. But here, only keyframes each second are labeled. And the task is to predict the actions at a keyframe, given the temporal context around it. Here, we calculate the frame AP for individual keyframes. For our ablation study on UCF 101, we can see that from the different aggregation functions, max pooling works the best. This is possibly because it's the most resistant to outliers. The uncertainty estimation provides a solid improvement too. We also get quite close to fully supervised performance, obtaining about 80% of the AP at an IU threshold of 0.5. One thing to note though, is that the detector we use for training was not trained on UCF, but only on COCO. And it's actually not very accurate due to this domain gap. The recall is only 47% on the training set, which means it often misses the person doing the actions. And its precision is only 21%,
because it often detects people who are not doing the labeled action in the dataset. Finally, note that sampling tubelets from the video is necessary. In all of our experiments, we use tubelets of length 16 frames, and, and they are an average of 33.1 non-overlapping tubelets per video in the training set. And of these, our GPU can only hold 16. We outperformed the state-of-the-art weekly supervised methods on this dataset by a large margin. The most related method to us is the work of Sharon et al., which is based on discriminative clustering. That allows them to incorporate more constraints, but it also means that they are effectively learning a linear classifier on top of deep features. And so we think our end-to-end -end trend method is able to produce better results. Note that we use the same detections as this paper for our evaluation on UCF. For the fully supervised case, we are competitive, but not state of the art. We believe this is because we use external person detections rather than training jointly with the network. We think this is useful here because of the big domain gap between UCF and other person datasets. And now we move on to our results in AVA. Recall that AVA only labels keyframes each second and that the videos are very long. So here we vary the amount of supervision by aggregating the labels over predefined time intervals. The shortest time interval we consider is one second, which is just one keyframe, and the longest is a whole 15 minute video. As one would expect, the accuracy decreases the longer the subclips are, as the problem becomes more difficult. For short subclips of less than five seconds, we are quite close to fully supervised performance. This suggests that person bounding boxes are not so important when labeling these datasets, but rather the temporal windows of the actions. Note that there are no weekly supervised works to compare to on this dataset because it's still quite new.